Hello, my name is Matteo Lancini. Thank you for the introduction. I work in measurement system and I'm going to present you something about measurement system to evaluate and improve gate training for exoskeleton users. Uh, I'll try to be as quick as possible to avoid uh, delaying the lunch, but first of all, I would like you to uh, know where we are. We're in Brescia, which is midpoint between Milan and Venice. Our university is, uh, has a strong engineering background, and we work in collaboration with a lot of uh, rehabilitation clinics in the region that do have uh, uh, robotic rehabilitation systems. What I'm going to present you today is a measurement system targeted uh, for user of uh, powered uh, uh, orthosis for spinal cord injury subjects. So they are paraplegic, they have no motor or perception function uh, below the uh, lesion level. And uh, the case study we are going to work on is a commercial available exoskeleton like the rewalk. Which is, uh, which is used for uh, overground locomotion and the mobilization of uh, lower limbs. As many commercial exoskeleton, if not all, uh, for rehabilitation, uh, the usage of crutches is required. So the subject cannot uh, avoid uh, using crutches or other assisted <coughs> devices. So it's the exoskeleton, the user, and the other assistive devices. Training with these systems can be an issue, especially because the user has to learn how to interact with the robot, and especially we need to take into account that the user is not a healthy subject. He has no feeling of his lower limbs, so we rely only on the upper limb sensation to guide him. One of the issues that could arise during training is the overloading of the upper limbs, in particular of the shoulders. And we know by literature that overloading of the shoulders leads to pain and additional pathologies. And also, if I push too hard on the crutches, I risk a backward fall. And this system cannot prevent backward falls. So that are the two uh, don'ts of this training. The issue is, from the therapist's point of view, is that he is able to assess the shoulder loads only by visual inspections. So training cannot be focused on how to limit the upper lip loads, how to improve the upper limb loads. So we were tasked with uh, a challenge, which is to provide quantitative measurement of the upper limb loadings during training. Uh, that is, in particular, the therapy support level. So how much force is the therapist applying on the subject, if needed, when needed, to prevent falling? And uh, the joint reaction forces in the shoulder, because they need to be lowered to a certain amount to avoid chronic pathologies. And also, they would like to use all this, some quantitative index to increase and uh, empower the user during the training. All this information is somehow related to forces that are passing through the subject body and then to the exoskeleton and not the other way around. So the main challenges were to integrate the measurement system into standard gate protocols because if we are not able to integrate our measurement system into standard gate lab protocols, then the therapist won't be using it. It's difficult to understand, and it takes too much time, they won't use it. Again, since both the user time and the therapist time is very limited, it's very precious, we need to have a very low setup time, because a lot of very good measurement system and a, and a lot of very good Robotic rehabilitation devices are not used simply because it takes too much time to set it up. So we also have, obviously, a low impact on the subject gate, and we need to adjust to every subject. And another thing, we need to avoid systems that depend on body measurements. So it's not like the usual gate assessment where I can measure everything of my subject 
and then let him walk, because it's not so easy and it's very time-consuming uh, time to measure a segment length of a spinal cord injury subject. He cannot stand, he cannot walk, so we need to lie him down, measure him, and then pull him back up. It's very expensive, it requires more than one person, and it takes a lot of time. So we need to uh, make a system like was presented before, that is not patient-specific, but adapt itself to the patient without measurement. We have three solutions proposed that I'm proposing you also as a suggestion for uh, understanding how can you evaluate uh, wearable robotics in your field. The first was simply an enhanced gate lab where we used the standard equipment that most gate labs have, like uh, uh, motion capture system and uh, force platforms and we introduced also instrumented crutches. The second solution was pushing a bit further. We replaced the marker-based motion capture with the markerless motion captures so we can have a wider area to monitor. And the last solution was a further improvement and was to take everything outside of the lab. So we, we took the instrumented crutches and we had smart sensing in uh, the crutches to avoid at all to have a gate lab. The first solution is quite straightforward. We have the kinematics from motion capture based on markers like Vicons or something similar. We have the fit ground reaction forces. We have the ground reaction forces from the crutches and we have an optimization system that optimizes the parameter of a very simplified model from the which we compute inverse dynamics and then the joint reaction forces. <laughs> Instrumented crutches uh, were uh, developed internally. They provide a force sensor with a full range of 600 newtons and uh, very low uncertainty. And uh, they also record uh, at the same time the acceleration, the orientation in space of the crutch. And uh, uh, they do have a programmable beeper to interact with the user, but the user asked us to detach it, so we simply removed it. And obviously they're wireless, so there's no cable running around and such. The simplify model is really, really simple. I think it's the most basic possible model. Uh, it's just 13 rigid bodies, no wobbling masses, no muscular components, and 30 degrees of freedom. The reason of this choice is that we need to limit the number of parameters that have to be assessed because I can get a very good model for study using like the delft shoulder model or very complex model of the human body, but that can be done only for uh, studies working on a small set of subjects where I do a lot of work to parameterize and characterize every parameter. In this case, I'm thinking of something that how to adapt uh, to the patient. How does it adapt? adapt? The first adaptation is uh, quite simple. Height and weight are measured. Actually, they're not measured. They're uh, asked of to the patient. The patient usually recalls his body weight and their body height uh, from before the accident. So there should be an adaptation and that is from uh, the vision system and the force platforms. After that, we uh, compute the segment length of each body link using the virtual joint technique. So we look for, uh, using an optimization, the center of rotation of each uh, segment with respect to its parent. And we get a set of virtual joints. The distance between the virtual joints is a segment length. After that, we need to optimize the distribution of masses you need to take into account that you cannot trust anthropometric data because it's based on the average population. Spinal cord injury subjects have very muscular upper limbs uh, and very thin lower limbs, and the mass distribution is different from an able bodied. So, what we do actually is to have the market from the market trajectory, we extract the center of masses of each segment, and so we have the trajectory of the center of mass of each segment. From all the external forces on acting on the body, 
we have the total resulting forces acting on the system. So we have the acceleration of the center of mass. Those two have to be related, so there is an optimization that decreases the difference between the comp trajectory and its acceleration. Obviously, by integrating one and uh, uh, deriving the other. Just to let you see what this means, you see a beginner on the left side and an expert on the right side. I'm sorry, but on the right side we had the low, uh, slow motion recording, so it's really going slower than it's in real life. And as you notice, uh, the uh, beginner needs a therapist, is uh, very unsure how to proceed, while uh, the expert user is comfortable by himself and, well, quite fast, but you cannot see that because it's in slow motion. Sorry about that. One of the first results which was interesting for the therapists, is the single support system. It's really difficult only by looking at uh, the patient walking with the skeleton to understand if it's on two supports, three supports, four supports. Because the therapist has to stand behind, there's somebody else looking. So one of the first thing is that we can average the timing event, the uh, gate event and understand if the user is standing on just one leg. And that is the case because on the, on the second green line, the dotted green line, it means that both the crutches are lifted off the ground, they are swinging, and the red one, the second red one, the full line, is the heel contact of uh, the left uh, foot. So the left leg is winging in the first part and the crutches are already in the air. So the user is so expert, it can actually stand on one leg and the crutches are flying around. Another interesting difference between the expert and uh, uh, the beginner is the shoulder internal forces, which was one of the aim of this project. And uh, you can see that uh, the Forces are quite low. We have a peak of 15% of the body weight on the right side during the first step. And uh, there are a few things to notice here. First of all, we have a huge difference between the left side and the right side depending on the step. And uh, also the level, so the value of uh, the load, the peak load, is really lower than beginner's value has to be expected. So we have a limited peak and average contribution of the shoulder and we have an asymmetric behavior. So the first result was that the expert user behave differently and we cannot know which part is due to motor learning and adaptation, which part is due to trust issues because at the beginning they're really fear of falling and they do not trust the robot to sustain themselves. One of the issues we encountered is that marker-based instrumentation takes too, too much time to stop. And uh, you cannot use it for, you, you can propose hospitals to do that, but they won't, won't do it, because it takes too much time to use it during training. So we moved to a second solution without markers, so there was no setup time this time. And uh, uh, we had uh, uh, markerless motion capture. We know that they, uh, uh, they have uh, they have not the same high accuracy that marker-based systems have, especially when working with exoskeleton. But if we translate it to uh, the prediction of the load in the shoulder joints, we can see that they match. In fact, we have the uh, blue line, which was obtained by using a Kinect cluster system, so really low cost and the red one, which was used using the BTS, which is a Vicon line system. Also another thing to notice is that this is the same expert user as before, just six months after. And uh, if you may notice, it is working in a quite different way. The crutches are moved asynchronously. Although the producer does not recommend this motion, the therapist does not train the user to do that, but he does that. So, our findings that markerless systems 
are accurate enough if we use them to assess joint reaction, because probably the lower accuracy does not count in the computation. The asynchronous usage of crutches has to be taken into account because some users do prefer it. And the uh, level of lesion and dominance, height and weight, all have influence on what the user prefers to do. So, one thing that we have to take into account, uh, speaking of wearable robotics, is that users will adapt to the wearable robotics and use in unforeseen ways. Because, after all, humans are smart adapting systems. So, they are also in that. One issue that we did not solve with the markerless decision system was that uh, the force platform were constraining the subject to walk in a straight line corridor. So it's just a standard 10 minutes, six uh, meter walk, and it's really uh, not uh, representative of what happens after the user leaves the building. So we, we skipped the force measurement on the feet. We relied only on force measurement on the crutches. And we put a motion capture system, markerless obviously, on the crutches themselves. So we had the time of flight cameras miniaturized on the crutches. We're still waiting for approval to test them on uh, uh, spinal cord injury subjects. We did test them with table bodies and the results are good. Uh, but first of all, why are we taking everything outside? In uh, Brescia we had this event where a lot of rework users were all together and tried to walk around the hospital. It was raining and they started walking all around. Please try to notice how they are walking. Try to notice the difference between one user, the other, the other. If you see all 12 users, you see at least five different ways of using the crutches and adapting to the exoskeleton. And the same manufacturer, maybe a different model, but not so much different about those. Okay? And one other reason to test everything outside is uh, the effect that testing outside has on, uh, the, on the subject. We tested the same subject who, who was having a hard time using the device inside because uh, she encountered 13% fail. It means that 13% uh, of the time she tried to initiate the step, the robot stuck, was stuck because she could not transfer the load on the standing limb to provide room for the step initiation. So 13% of the time, she wasn't able to initiate the step correctly. And outside of the lab, this was 0%, and we achieved double the speed. Okay, one thing that uh, shocked us, uh, but uh, I've learned yesterday that it's not so strange, is that the asymmetry indexes uh, were higher. So the user was walking better, but with higher asymmetries and with higher loads. So uh, what we need to take into account is that users behave differently when outside of the lab. So when they are not tested, but simply perform everyday uh, activities, which is the activities that are supposed to be performed using the exoskeleton. Uh, that performance improves, but low desire. And this means that user adaptation is not always in the direction of a more physiological motion. We can have a better performing spinal cord injury subject walking more with a less physiological motion. So it's not always the physiological motion of a able body that we have to look for. And one of key aspects I need to point out here is that we need to measure the exoskeleton in an everyday system. Uh, the issue here is we obviously had to uh, forego the ground reaction forces. Some of my conclusions, uh, that training to use wearable robotics should be assessed with quantitative data, also because the users require it. And we need to take into account that exoskeleton can be used in very different ways. And I believe that the user have to be part also of the design process because we need to understand 
how they will really use the exoskeleton. One of the subjects did not use the exoskeleton to actually walk, but she used it because she needed to be standing to work on uh, animals because she was a veterinarian. And that was her mind target, okay? And also we need to take into account what happens outside the lab. So some points for us or you developer of wearable robotics. We need to take into account the human side. Measurement have to be provided in a friendly setting. And one of the key issue for me, I'm a measurement expert, I don't control robotics, I don't design robotics, I design just measurement system, so I benchmark eventually robotics, is you have a lot of sensors in your system. It's really difficult once the product goes to market to still have access to this data. And it could be really helpful to integrate it with gate labs, other research settings. So that is really a key factor. I was also asked to point out some points for discussion. So these are my personal point of discussion. Obviously, I'm a measurement expert, so I'll try to push for it. But is measurement a key enabling tool for wearable robotics? In my opinion, measurement and modeling, the human, should be key tool for wearable robotics development. First of all, because you need to evaluate the wearable robotic performance on the human. So if you don't have measurement system in place to monitor also the human, you won't have a feedback on that. And also, having quantitative measurement systems will help uh, not only to understand what's going on with your robot, but also for approval, because you can say, okay, I'm studying this variable for training, because user will tend to use it more and will be driven towards better results, and this will lead ultimately to a huge marker adoption. Second point, we need to use and develop measurement system that do have some very hard lines to respect. First of all, we need to measure what the users interact with. In case of the exoskeleton, if I do a build an exoskeleton that requires crutches, then the crutches are part of the system. Do not neglect them. Any other assistant device, like a walker, needs to be also part of my system. Again, work in a friendly environment, because people behave differently. I've heard a lot of my subjects saying that the robot worked really, really bad when it was raining outside. So, that's another issue to take into account. And also, it would be really nice to integrate the data already available in a wearable robotic sensor with outcome from the gate lab, test beds, and all benchmarking that could be performed using humans in the loop. Thank you. Thank you.